It's a privilege to be with you this morning and to be behind this uh, pulpit and to serve uh, the Reed family. And it's my privilege to look at the book of Jonah uh, with you. You know, sometimes as guest preachers, you rarely get assigned a passage. You kind of bring a sugar stick, you drop an atom bomb, and then you leave, you know, because they don't know you. And so they're like, ah, that guy was kind of weird. But, you know, and it makes the pastor look good that when we're weird as guest speakers, you know. In this case, he assigned the passage, the book of Jonah, and I was like, oh, what's the text? And I was thinking, because there's some okay stuff in Jonah. All of scripture is good, but there was some okay text. This is the best one. So he saved the best for me, and so I'm excited because I looked, I was like, oh, there's so much. And then he then reduced it to 35 minutes, so that's a problem um, because I graduated from the master's seminary and was exec pastor at Grace Community Church Sun Valley, and we go an hour strong all day long, right? So I'm having to cut a little bit, but that's okay. I'm just laying the groundwork here. We've got a lot of work to do. It's a great Sunday because we're going to study chapter one of Jonah, and you see before me the Lord's table, so we get to celebrate uh, the, the Lord's table together at the end of our time. So take your copy of God's Word. I'm using the NASB, so it's a little bit different. Not, It's just the Bible Jesus used, and so I want to be more specific than <laughs> what Brandon might use um, on a regular basis. So that's what we're doing. So I'm in the NASB, but I'll, I'll try to be faithful. I read uh, my daily Bible reading out of the ESV, so I'm very familiar with it and appreciate it. So I've entitled our time together uh, this morning, Going Rogue, A Rebel's Guide to the Sovereignty of God. Going Rogue, The Rebel's Guide to the Sovereignty of God. She read the text this morning, James, uh, Jonah 1, 4 to 17. So that's 13 verses. We got a little bit of work to do, right, um, this morning. So we got to get busy. You ready to get busy? Let's sit up, go get coffee. If you start wearing down, I'll call you out. You run, get coffee, come back. You know, we'll just have a time uh, this, this time uh, this morning. So that's our text before us. I want to begin by reminding us all that there are atheists uh, in the world. There's 4% of uh, U.S. citizens claim to be an atheist. A new Pew study just came out February 7th and gave a little bit of demography around that 4%. It's mostly men under the age of 49. Mostly men under the age of 49 fit into that 4% category of being an atheist, whereby they reject or deny the existence of God. They want their own principles. They want their own moral code. They want their own religion, so to speak. And so they refuse to submit or to come up under the, the sovereignty of God. That's what we call an atheist, an atheist. This morning, I want to add another category for you to think about, and that's a practical atheist. A practical atheist is one who believes in God, yet there's some behavior that's contradictory. They're living contradictions. You could say it like that. They're living in such a way that they are actually contradicting their resolved belief in God, right? They deny the sovereign will of God, not the sovereignty of God, but God's sovereign will. They're living as if God is irrelevant. It's not worked out in their life. It's not evident. Something's not right, yet they make claims, truth claims, that they're in Christ and they have a relationship with the Lord, and many do, but if you look at their life, something's gone awry. They're, they're a little bit funky. They're not, they're not walking with the Lord. That's a practical atheist. Well, this morning, Jonah, I think we can put in that second category of being a practical atheist. He's a rogue prophet of God, a type of practical atheist, okay? So he believes in God. He's a prophet of God. He's called by God, but his behavior is denying his belief claim. Let me give you a little bit of context. How's that? Uh, Brandon did a great job last week. If you were here, you can go back and listen to it, but laying down the context for the entire book study because we believe in sequential exposition, right? Verse upon verse upon verse. We build, we stack, we layer, and, and that theology, that biblical theology comes to life. <clears throat> so let me give you a couple pieces of context that he didn't mention to add to what you already have. First, you know 
that he's a prophet. So what God's asking him to do to go share the gospel with Nineveh is not outside the box. It's a matter of fact, pretty, pretty pedestrian. It it's, should be normal for him to want to share the gospel with Nineveh. The book of Jonah is the first missiological book of the Old Testament. Another interesting piece, it's the only autobiographical book in the Minor Prophets. And as we read this section today, you're going to see that Jonah as author paints himself in a bad light. We live in a day where, you know, they say, listen, minimize your weaknesses, accentuate your strengths. When we talk about leadership, that's a pretty common principle. Jonah does quite the opposite. He, he minimizes any strength he has and just lays into his weaknesses, his, his rebellion, his disobedience here in Jonah chapter one. So it's quite, quite interesting. Our text today is full of ironies, contradictions, and even a little bit of miracles. The reason why we're studying this today in the book of Jonah is because Jonah is protesting God's grace to the people of Nineveh. He knows, chapter four, verse two, he knows that God will save them. He knows that God's going to do a tremendous work in their lives, and he doesn't like them. You've heard this phrase, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. He hated the sinner and hated the sin. Like, he like went way beyond what he should have uh, done in, in, in his ministry, and he's protesting the grace of God. And as Brandon said last week, God said to go, and he said, no, I'm not going. Where Isaiah would say, say, here I am, send me. Jonah says, here I am, send somebody else. I'm not going. Like, I am not going to these people. And, and it's in, in, in context, in fairness, Nineveh was like the Nazi Germany of the 8th century BC. It, it was brutal. I mean, the, the Assyrians were, they were mean. They, they were terrorists. They, they were not pretty. So he, he has no love for them, and he is clearly going to protest God's saving grace in their lives. Last little piece before we dive in. There's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. If we're honest, there's a little bit of rebel. There's a, there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. And, and I think it's important. We're all prone, or to use a nautical term, we list towards this kind of rebellion at times, hypocrisy at times, you know, and what happens in chapter one, as you'll see, is when someone's ensconced, enveloped totally uh, with, with rebellion in their heart. Okay, so he's more pathetic than he is prophetic. That's one of the ironies in chapter one. But we need the book of Jonah for the grace of God, the grace of God towards Nineveh, and we need the grace of God when we're in this kind of rebellious state. Jonah fails on the two big epic commandments, right? Love God and love your neighbor. He's in disobedience to God and he certainly does not love the Ninevites. But what we see in God's grace is his relentless pursuit while he's in full rebellion. And it's encouraging to see. There's three kind of basically indicators that I want you to see this morning from Jonah chapter one, to help us like a mirror, to look into that mirror and see, is, is or are any rebellion setting in in your heart, in your family, in your life, in your career, in, your, in wherever, in, actually, in your community life, whatever it is, I want you to be able to recognize what rebellion looks like and the indicators. The first is apathy will set in, will be apathetical. The second will be that we'll be hypocritical and third, as we progress through the passage, will be illogical. It won't even make sense, right? It won't, it won't even add up. It doesn't pencil um, for, uh, for us to take a look. So are you ready to get busy this morning? Jump into the text. All right, here we go. Let's look into the mirror as Jonah paints himself in a pretty bad light. Number one, rebellion makes us apathetical. Rebellion makes us apathetical. You see this in verses four through six. What you have here is God hurling, like a fastball, hurling this great storm at Jonah. And his attempt is to run and to flee from God's presence. 
Now, we can import and bolt on Psalm 139, right? Psalm 139 asks the question, where can I run from his presence? And then over and over again, the psalmist, David, writes, you can't. You can't flee. You can't outrun God. And so this is a, a practical picture of what it's like to try to attempt to outrun God. Because God's awesome, and in this text, for sure, in all of Jonah, God is fully on display. In, uh, in the 48 verses, he's mentioned 38 times in those 48 verses. Jonah, the book of Jonah, is not just about Jonah's disobedience. It's about God's grace, his pursuit, the, what I would call the relentlessness of God, that he would pursue this guy. The principle here in 4 to 6 is you can run, you can try, but you can't hide from God. And so what happens here in 4 to 6, the Lord, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. A lot of superlative language. In other words, this isn't a natural disaster, folks. This is a divine event. Even the salty veteran sailors recognize this is not normal on the high seas. This is something very different. They knew they were about to die. It was a kind of perishing kind of storm. And you see this over-the-top superlative language. There's a, great, uh, there's a great storm, a great wind. There's great fear on the sailors. There's a great fish in, in verse 17. So it's drawing attention. But what happens is people in, in don't interpret chapter 1 appropriately, and they focus only on verse 17, that great fish. I'm telling you, if you just focus on the great fish, you're going to miss that there's a great God all the way threaded through chapter one. So this event, this storm in four to six, is a judgment of God. How do you know? Well, you've got salty, veteran sailors. I mean, they do this for a living, and they're, they're scared. They're scared to death. They know this is a life-threatening storm on this particular sea. So this has got their attention. They know something's seriously wrong. It's not natural. And you also know that because they get religion, right? Take a look at the verses. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. So they're a polytheistic culture. Uh, they have regional gods, gods of the sea, gods of the land. And they were, they said, listen, this is the big one spread out Whoever you know that's got some divineness to them, call on them because we need serious external help. So they cried out to their gods, right? And then they got to work. I appreciate that a little bit like Nehemiah. You pray and you get to work and they get to work. Look what the text says. And they threw the cargo, which is in the ship, into the sea to lighten it for themselves. That's significant because they have a mission. They're going to move from one port all the way across the world to another port with cargo. That cargo represented dollars and cents, money, currency in their time. So for them to throw everything overboard, that's how serious this storm was. This isn't a little sun shower, a little you know, afternoon burst of, of rain. This is torrential, this is focused, this is divine, this is life-threatening. So they gotta get the ship up out of the water, right? So you lighten the load, so the ship rises pretty Pretty easy to understand. And the ship is literally, literally breaking apart because God's doing it. God's behind the storm. God's behind the wind. And then the next section. But Jonah, look at the text. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen fast or sound asleep. You feel the, you're like, what the heck? What's going on here? I mean, well, why would you do that? People's lives are at stake. Jonah goes to the hull of the ship. It's a wooden ship in the base of the ship. He stretches out. He gets comfy. He grabs a comforter of sorts, a burlap sack or something. He gets comfy, he wraps up, and he falls fast asleep. He's in REM. Like, he's in deep sleep. The whole ship is breaking apart, and this guy, God's prophet, is sound asleep in the hull. That's how self-absorbed he is. That's what defiance does. That's what makes you so apathetic. You don't care about anybody else. You just care about yourself. It's smug. 
self-righteousness, right? It's insensitivity. He's tone deaf. He can't even see that the whole thing's falling apart. Are you crazy? And that's the, that's the way he writes it. You get incensed. You're kind of agitated. Like, what kind of man, while the ship's falling apart, goes and takes a nappy? Like, that's craziness. And I, you're just, you get incensed. You read the text, and I just want to, you know, I want to bow up at him. I want to take a run at him, you know? I'm like, golly, you sorry dog. Right? It's the fruit of rebellion. If you don't want the fruit of sin, stay out of sin's garden. He has chosen to draw a line. I'm not going. I'm going to disobey. And I don't care its effect on anyone around me. And what's interesting, as you work your way through Jonah, Brandy will bring this up as well, but as you work your way through Jonah, you're going to see this word down a lot. Because that's what's happening. When you're in rebellion, you start spiraling down. He went down to Joppa. It got on a ship. He went down the gangplank and boarded the ship. He went down, the text says, to the bottom of the hull of the ship to take a nap. He's spiraling down, down, down. That's exactly what rebellion will do. It's an indicator. The apathy sets in in your heart. You don't care about anybody around you. And, and then you're, you're spiraling out of control. People look at that and they see it and it's obvious to them. They go, why is she like that? Why is he like that? Like, why, why are they making these kind of decisions? Because this this effect, this downward effect you're seeing in the book of Jonah. Well, then verse 6 comes. And the captain does a little survey of who's working and realizes, hey, what that guy that paid the full fare, right? The guy that paid the full fare, where's he? I mean, this is all hands on deck. He goes down, and it, you see in the text, and, and, and it, you know, so the captain approached him, and it's kind of like elegant. The captain approached him and, uh, and said to him, hey, man, uh, how, how is it that you're sleeping? No, it's more like this. Boy, get up. You know? It's like a dad to a, a teenage son who's just over and over again displayed laziness. It's, you know, it's, you kind of grab him by, it's like he's grabbing by the scruff of the neck and say, boy, you know, you're going to work today. You know, it, it has that feel, right? And so the captain can't believe it. He can't believe this guy's napping. He's sleeping, I'm telling you, he's sleeping his guilty conscience off. That's what you do. You, when you're in rebellion, you don't care about people, you're self-consumed, you're smug, self-righteous. You just want to make things go away. You want to put your fingers in your ears metaphorically. You want to stop the noise because the hounds of heaven are pursuing Jonah. God's pursuing Jonah. He knows. And so his gross inconsistency, right, is a, is a rebel's indicator. He's inconsistent. He's merciless towards people. He's careless. He's cold-hearted. Apathy has set in. And you're napping and everyone else is perishing. But he's no match for the sovereignty of God. God is in pursuit of Jonah. God is going to get his man whom God loves, Hebrews 12, he what? He chastens. Whom God loves, he, he chastens. So spiritual apathy, apathy in four to six, you're seeing it in full display. It just gets worse and worse. You don't remain neutral when you're apathetic. You get worse and worse and worse. You get out of control. And maybe there's been seasons in your life where you've experienced a bit of rebellion. And an indicator would be that apathy. When you just think, Phew, I don't care what my crazy neighbor thinks. I don't care what people at work think. I don't care what the elders think and the board thinks. I don't care what Brandon thinks. I'm gonna do what I want to do. You see, there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us, right? If we're honest, if I'm honest, there's that rebel. And, and the way I can identify it is this indicator that I'm apathetic towards people. As Jesus walked into Jerusalem, he what? Wept. He was brokenhearted. Instead of being brokenhearted about the Assyrians and the Ninevites' sin, right, he says, I don't care. They can rot in hell. I don't care. I am not going. So how are you doing with apathy? Is there any signs of apathy? It's the first indicator. And again, it, it doesn't get any better. It starts getting worse when it's unchecked and you don't keep short sin accounts and you don't take care of it, right? So next section, we leave verses 4 and 6. And we go to 7 to 10, and we're reminded that rebellion makes us hypocritical. 
Rebellion not only makes us apathetical, it makes us hypocritical. Now, here's what's crazy in 7 to 10. You feel more compassion for the pagan, polytheistic, salty, veteran sailors than you do the prophet of God, right? You feel more, more, more grace towards them. And, and then you move into all of these ironies. Look at it. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast, I'm sorry, verse, at the end of verse six, perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn of whose account this calamity has struck us. So what's interesting is they're gonna begin to pray and have prayed to their gods. They're praying Jonah's prayerlessness. He's napping. They fear God, verse 10, as you see, the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, how could you do this? They're frightened. They have a, a healthy fear of God. Jonah's completely indifferent and does not care what God wants or is doing. And it's just a reminder when you get into 7 to 10 that your sin affects other people. I think sometimes in our stupidity, our numbness, we think that we can sin alone and it affects us alone. It's not the case. It splashes like waves. It, it spills over into everyone around you. And it's certainly taken its effect on these sailors who are in the boat. He doesn't care, but it affects everyone around us. It's rarely, rarely, rarely when we're in sin isolated. So the sailors know that this is a divine storm. They want to know the causation. How do we figure out who it is Somebody needs to confess. Somebody needs to come clean. And so the way they did that, this is their ancient Near East version of drawing straws. They're going to cast lots. Now, that's not an unfamiliar um, way in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, of course, but God's providence, right? They cast, the lot is cast, and the judgment is from the Lord. Proverbs 16 Verse 33, so what they would do is they'd get two stones, right, and they would color them black on one side and white on the other, and if you got a black one and a white one, that was a no, it wasn't you. If you got two black ones, that was a no, but if you got two whites, it was a yes, and lo and behold, Jonah rolls the stones. Snake eyes, got him. They then look directly at him and say, you are the cause. I think they were probably suspicious that he was the guy, but now it's confirmed because God's providence guides the process. Not a perfect process, uh, not one you probably ought to execute at work today in your business plan. However, in this time, in the Old Testament, it was like the way they had to figure things out when they were stuck. And even, listen, everything responds to God. The fish the sailors, the stones, the only person, the only one who's not responding to God in Jonah chapter one is Jonah. This is crazy. Do you sense the, the craziness of it? Everything responds except Jonah. And so they cast the lots. So they cast the lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So then they've got him, bingo. And so they, they level some questions. They ask five specific questions. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do for a living? Like, what is your people group? I mean, why are you running? Why is this divine storm pursuing you? And it just, it's just going to point out Jonah's hypocrisy as he answers these five questions. His hypocrisy is steeped. It's unbelievable. So he responds in quick, rapid fashion. Look what he said. He said to them, I'm a Hebrew, verse 9. I fear the Lord God, the Lord God of the heaven and the one who made the sea and the dry land. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you sense the hypocrisy? I mean, if you're just reading it casually, you might not pick up on that, that he's in full defiance. He's a practical atheist. He's now his behaviors is not following his, his belief system. And in rapid fire, he just fires back. I'm a Hebrew. They knew who Hebrews were. They knew the God. You can see them quickly switch over to worshiping God. His answers, answers are orthodox, right? 
but they're hypocritical. You fear God, really? You fear God and you're running from this God? It's like you saying, I love the Lord, and I'm, but I don't read my Bible. It's a bit hypocritical, right? Because God chose to manifest himself through one book. He, he, God came to us with, in a book. He wrote a book. You want to know God? You got to know the book. It's a book. So if you're not reading the book, it makes us wonder on the board, like, hey, are they doing okay as a family? Are they doing okay as a couple? Do they read scripture? You're like, What's, what is that? Why wouldn't you want to know the mind of God on everything, right? And so it gets to be a little bit hypocritical. And you sense it in here in the text that talks cheap, isn't it? He's talking a better game that he's living. And it's cheap. He's claiming to love God, but he's living like the devil in full defiance, right? And so he gives his resume. But I want you to understand there's one question he leaves off. He answers the four. He leaves off one. He left off one answer, and that was, what do you do for a living? What's your occupation? Why? He's a prophet of God. It's not a stretch for a prophet of God to go preach the gospel. That's what they do. A jockey rides a horse, right? A race car driver drives a big, bad race car. A prophet preaches the gospel. This isn't a stretch. This shouldn't be hard for him, right? It's crazy that, that he would do that. What is your occupation? Why? He's embarrassed. He's got a bad testimony. He's not doing what's right. He's running from his employer, right? He's running. His inconsistencies are magnanimous, over the top. His hypocrisy is pronounced and, and, and nauseating, right? He's a rogue prophet trying to run from the sovereignty of God. And so what you have here in summary, you have, you have, he has good theology, but bad character. Good theology, but bad living, inconsistent. He's hypocritical in what he's saying. He needs to clean up his act. This self-righteousness is on full display. He's puffing his chest up, right? Knowledge puffs up, 1 Corinthians 8. And folks, it's a reminder to all of us. It's not how much you know. It is how much you live. A lot of us have a lot of knowledge about God. And you've been studying the scripture for years but are we living? It's not how much this Bible, you get of this Bible. It's how much the Bible grips you and kind of owns you. And in here, it's gross hypocrisy. And Jonah needs to be humbled, right? James 4, verse 6, right? God does what? Resist the proud. Gives grace to the humble. You want grace? It comes, it accompany, it's accompanied by your pronounced humility. You see, again, there's a little bit of Jonah of all of us, right? We've all found ourselves at time a little bit hypocritical at work. We're telling people about Jesus and how much we love him and how he talks and how we pray. And yet we don't pray and we don't read our Bibles. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's just be brutally honest with each other here. It's us, right? We're family. Let's talk a little bit. We're about to experience a family meal together, right? So we can have this conversation. There's a little bit of Jonah in, in all of us. And then in verse 10, then the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was now fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. He told them he was running. He told them he's not going to be on mission. They're willing to give up on their mission as sailors to save his life. He's not willing to go on mission and to reach the people. And so Jonah gets exposed in his rebellion He's exposed that he's running from God's will. And just a, just a footnote, Brandon picked up on this last week. I think it was good. I just want to double click on it a little bit. You know, a lot of times when we pray, you say, God, open the door. And a lot of times God does open the door. It's a true statement. But the devil does too. Right? You remember what Paul said? The devil comes as an angel of an angloss of what? Light. He's not coming with red horns. It's not Halloween. He's going to come like a, a date. Boy, that guy looked really nice. He's all buttoned up. He's a serial killer on the back end. But he, he looked kind of nice when I first met him. You know what I'm saying? Ladies, you've had that kind of moment? Yeah. I'm just saying, he'll provide a ship for you. He'll be glad to provide your ship. He even funded it. I'll provide the fare. There was no opposition, like God could have shut him down, no ship in port. No, there's one in port. 
Devil will provide a ship too. It'll be a cruise liner. It won't be this rickety old wooden thing that you're rowing on. No, no, it'll be a cruise liner. He'll provide you anything you want. So I just want you to be aware that the devil will come as an angel of light. A, devil, a good devilology. I'm not saying you're spooked or scared, but I'm just saying you ought to understand his methodologies. And it's most of the time, it isn't just opening a door. I've seen it as a college pastor for 14 years. He's opened so many relationship doors. I talk to the guys like, oh, the Lord opened the door. You know, and now she's right there. And I'm like, oh, boy, Turbo, you got some work to do. You know what I'm saying, theologically? Like, you just got to kind of, like, balance out your, your theology a, a bit, right? So they knew he was fleeing from the Lord. We know, post-op, Psalm 139, you can't. You can't run far enough. You can't go under the cover of darkness, uh, David said. You, you can't go to the depths of the sea or to the Sheol itself. You can't even go to hell itself and hide out from God. God knows you're there. I mean, it's a comprehensive, omnipresent, sovereign God over your life. If you're in the team, you're on team Jesus, then guess what? You have that in your life. He won't go, sadly, in his hypocrisy, because he knows God will save him. Brandon will get there in chapter four. You'll see that. Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out, right? Here's another principle. The longer you rebel and you remain steadfastness, uh, the Old Testament calls it stiff-necked, where you're just stubborn, spiritually stubborn, sir, the longer you remain in it, the harder it is to get back. It doesn't mean you can't repent and can't get back. There's grace for that. But I'm just saying, the more entrenched you get, then pride kicks in. And you start digging in. And you start healing it. And that's what he's doing. He's in the bottom of the ship. He's sleeping. He doesn't care about anybody. He, you know, he, he's just in a really bad place. His, his practical atheism is staggering. It's real and it's staggering. And what's so crazy when you leave verse 10 is... You're convinced Jonah, the prophet of God, is the villain. Like, don't you gotta have a little, like, aren't you a little mad at Jonah this morning? Like I am. Maybe I'm just working myself up and I'll deal with that sin. But you know what I'm saying? I'm like, you sorry dog, I man, come on, bro. Like, let's do this. Like, what is happening here? And the ironies, I mean, it's really bad. Then we're introduced to the third and final piece as you look into the mirror, rebellion, it's an indicator, right? You look in there and you go, rebellion will make you illogical. It'll make you hypocritical. It will make you apathetic. And it will make you illogical. Why? Here's the principle. Sin makes you stupid. <laughs> it really does. It's a byproduct of sin. How many people you might go, why can he not see that? Or your kids, you got kids. I've got, I'm raising boys, not crops, but boys in the Central Valley. And um, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just looking, I'm like, bro, you are dumb. Like, how in the world do you keep repeating your sin? You know, it's really easy. You do your schoolwork, you get a grade. You brush your teeth once a week, you have nice teeth. These are boys. We don't have high expectations on boys, right? We don't get good until we're 30. We're basically dumb until we're 30, ladies. You should know that. If you don't, let me inform you, that's the deal, right? Our brains don't develop as fast as yours. Uh, hygiene's not a big deal to us. We've got other, other business to take care of, you know, than that. You get it. Sin makes you stupid. And, they, and you don't act with clarity. You don't act with sobriety. You don't act like, wow. You, you get full of pride. It puffs up. You think you're tough. You think you're better than everyone. And the first thing that goes is you throw off the fear of God. It makes you totally illogical, right? The fear of God, Proverbs 1, 7 says, is the beginning of wisdom. It's, the, it's foundation. It's ground zero for character. You throw it off. You get rid of it. It's illogical, but you're going to do it, right? It's crazy. And so the sailors ask, how do we make this storm stop? The sea is raging. It's getting worse. So verse 11, they said to him, what should we do that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. So they're asking, what do we do? They, they, he's, conf he's now the guy. He, they pinned him down. He's not repentant, but he's now the guy, right? 
he, he's entrenched um, in his sin, right? And, and, um, and so he responds. He says, I'll tell you what, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Well, at first you're going, hey, that's admirable, right? That's self-sacrifice. We're seeing an indication he made a turn. Not really. Not really. It's cowardly and illogical. If he was the man of God, what would he do? He'd jump, right? He'd jump in the water. I can end this, whoop, Peter Pan, right off the edge. He'd jump and go in swimming. No, he, does. he makes them do the volitional act, as assisted suicide. He puts it on their guilt conscience. He puts it on their backs, right? What a coward. He'd rather die. Listen to this. He would rather die than preach the gospel. His rebellion in his thinking, this is how illogical it is, is better than the sweetness of God. One day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. It's better. The joy of God, he'd rather die than have the joy of God. He'd rather die than obey his calling, which is to preach the gospel. He should have repented on the spot, mea culpa, Peter Pan. He jumps in. That's what he should have done. But he's entrenched. However, the sailors, they're awesome. So he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea would become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, the great storm has come upon you. However, there's another irony, another craziness. However, the men rowed desperately. They dug in. In athletics, we call it, put it in all in the field, right? They're, they're digging in. They're gonna get to dry land. Because they know he's offended the God of the sea. He already said he serves the God of the sea and the land. So they're like, okay, so you're running from the God of the sea. Not good, illogical, <laughs> right? No bueno, not smart. So they dig in and row. They put it all in the field, right? And then they prayed. Look at this. We earnestly pray, O oh Lord. They ditched polytheism. They're now monotheistic. We we earnestly pray, do not let us perish on account of this guy's life and do not put his innocent blood on us for you, O Lord, have done this so you have, you have done as you have pleased. So they dig in, they roll like crazy. They become monotheists. Overnight, they're Calvinists, right? They're like, we believe in the sovereignty of God. God's in control. He controls the sea, controls everything. We're not gonna let this guy get us. So they row, they pray, I mean, this is, a, this is God pursuing them. And what they realize is God's just got a finger on the bow. So they're like rowing like crazy, and he's just got a finger on the bow. He's whipping up a tempest, your ESV. He's got a finger on the bow. Like, you ain't going anywhere. Let me tell you something. God's sovereignty in your life. If you believe in God's sovereignty, you should pill your head on it every single night. But he knows exactly where you're at. He knows what you look at. He knows what you see. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. That's the reality. That's what keeps me short, keeping short sin accounts because I know he knows everything. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. And, and they're actually thinking, okay, now we're going to serve God. And, and Jonah's thinking, I'm going to get away with it. I'm not going to go. And what's interesting, I feel like, verse 15, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice and made vows. So they feared God Offered sacrifice, made vows. I just sense here, as we wrap up, I just sense that they probably became believers. In spite of Jonah's testimony, in spite of him being the one leading them to the Lord, he's driving them to the Lord, and they know this is a, this is a God thing. And it sure does, it's not confirmed, but it sure does look like saving faith. Because after the dangers passed, they hurl him in the sea, right? They threw him in the sea, then they sacrifice, then they make vows, then they do all of these things. They knew the power of Yahweh. They turned from polytheism, call on any God, call on your God, to God of the universe, sovereign Yahweh, sovereign Lord of the universe, we need your help. They didn't make dry ground, they hurled, again, God hurled a storm, they hurled him overboard, right? And they hurled him into the sea, and the storm's calmed, and then they repent and believe. 
They're different. See the irony? Jonah should be the one, the lead repenter, the lead evangelist. And he's nowhere to be found. He's absent. He's derelict with his duties. And then verse 17. You think it's over, right? Poor old sap. He got what he deserved, right? It's fair. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Well, God always gets his man. He always keeps his man, right? God knows how to get our attention. It's the relentlessness of God. It's a doctrine of relentlessness that he will pursue you. The 99-1, you see it in the news. He will pursue you and pursue you. If you're self-willed and smug, he will pursue you. If you're a rogue leader, if you're running from God, the rogue prophet here, this book's all about ironies and miracles. Now he appoints a great fish, right, to rescue Jonah in his rebellion. He's swallowed alive. It's a different kind of vessel he's on now. It's a preservation miracle. God preserves him. Literally, he feels like he's in the belly of hell Brandon will deal more with this next week. Three days, three nights, wet, slimy, gasping for air. And what's crazy is his deliverance here, this preservation deliverance miracle becomes the very analogy that Jesus uses in Matthew 12 to describe his three days and three nights post-crucifixion in the grave. Man, I'll tell you, the deliverance is beautiful. Jonah thinks he gets away with it. Not a chance. God redirects a fish, a fish large enough to eat him, also a fish large enough to beach himself in the end of chapter two and vomit him back on the beach. It's like, you know, you're going, baby. You go and launches him back down there. And it's just a reminder that as crazy as Jonah is, Jesus is greater. Jesus, Jesus is our great deliverer, and when he talked about deliverance, he went to Jonah to show how stark it is. Whom I love, I discipline, I pursue, I care for. He loves us so much. He sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us, right? So I ask you where I began. Maybe you're here this morning, and you haven't been in a church in a long time, and maybe you might even tinker with thinking you're an atheist. You don't believe in the existence of God. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're a practical atheist. You believe there was a time in your life where you were transformed and you were walking with the Lord, but you've been in rebellion, sustained for a period of time. And you need to come clean. You need to confess, you know, because whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Actually, his discipline is an expression of his love. No discipline, you wonder, any love? Anyone home there? Right? Right? And we'd encourage you to fall and repent before we take the Lord's table. You know, and even this morning as we fence the table, if you're not right with the Lord, please do not take the table. People died in 1 Corinthians 11. Like, it's a serious deal, right? Again, there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us, right? Can we admit that? We all have a little bit of rebellion. And when your rebellion starts spiraling out of control, you'll... Apathy will set in, hypocrisy will set in, right? And stupidity will set in. You'll be illogical. It won't, you won't even make sense. You won't even be able to make good decisions. You'll be grappling, like Proverbs 1 says, you'll be grappling for scriptures and wisdom, and wisdom will evade you, chapter 1 of Proverbs. It really will run from you because you haven't deposited, you haven't worked and cultivated. Your heart's fallow, and you've got to right, get the fallow heart cleaned up and churned and ready for the seed of of God's word. And we end chapter one, Jonah in a whale or a fish, great fish. Next week, Brandon will pick up in chapter two and you're gonna see that he prays from the fish. You You think you can run? He's gonna have the prayer of his life inside a fish. You think you can run from God, sir? No chance. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Jonah and him writing himself like this, self-deprecating, 
being brutally honest so that we could see ourselves in him and see ourselves in the mirror. Lord, I pray for us that we would keep short sin accounts. You would root out the rebellion. You would have us to have a burden for our community, for our neighbors, our, our fellow employees, that we would be burdened about their souls. And we ask this in the name of King Jesus. Amen.